and welcome. I'm Michelle Merchant Johnson with Love Life Coaching, and I'm so excited to welcome you to the show today because we have a very lovely special guest, and that is the lovely Krista Beck. Welcome, Krista. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So excited about having you. I am excited about talking about some of the key things that are in your book. Um, because I know, <laughs> because I know it's going to really benefit our audience. <laughs> so just a short intro before we jump right in. Chris okay. Beck, The Love Radar, has been featured on ABC, NBC, Fox, and TEDx. She is the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Break the Glass Slipper, Free Yourself from Fairy Tale Fantasies, and Find True Love in Real Life. Her message has been heard by over a million people globally. We hope to add to that number here. Ooh, okay. <laughs> With over 20,000 hours of meditation, as well as a, an award-winning violinist, Krista brings pure love to her 11 plus years as a dating coach and matchmaker. So I really am excited about interviewing you. As I shared with you, Krista, I've been reading your book. And I really, really love some of the myths and fantasies that you take on in this book because um, as a coach myself and working mainly with women 40 and above, a lot of the women that I work with bump up against the things that you're talking about in your book, myths or fantasies, whatever we'd like to call them. So I'd like to take on a couple of these and okay. hear your thoughts about them, right? Yeah. So one common one, of course, and this is my own story too, because I, I met and married my husband in my 40s, first time bride in my 40s. Mm -hmm. A lot of the women, if they're a little later in life and they've had some unsuccessful relationships, maybe some heartbreak or disappointment, they feel like it's too late for them, whether they're in their mm -hmm. 40s, 50s, 60s, or wherever. Mm -hmm. But what do you have to say to that particular myth, belief, or fantasy? Yeah, I think there's a lot of women and you'd be surprised the age that women actually start saying that and asking me that. I've had women in my 30s and in their 30s say, am I too old to date? Is, mm -hmm. Am I at the right age to date? And in my book, I actually break that. I give that whole topic a whole chapter because I found over and over again in my practice that I just kept hearing women say that. And then when I dug a little deeper, I really got to see that there's this messaging really from Hollywood, from Disney, you're supposed to be a certain age, you're supposed to be at a certain level of beauty. There's only like the, and there's this, when you hear that messaging, and I was going to say subtle messaging, but in Hollywood, sometimes it's not so subtle, like right. you need to be young, you need to be this, but I really break down this fairy tale. No one is too old to date. Everyone, no matter what age you are, can find someone, can date someone, can enjoy dating, can have fun dating. And I'm just like, I've worked with people from in their 20s all the way up into their 70s. So it really is like, it's just a barrier that I think a lot of women have, especially if they've been divorced or they haven't dated before, if they've been not taking action, it's really easy to for our minds to start kind of creating reasons why they shouldn't date. And that's a really big reason. Am I too old? Oh, I'm too old. And it kind of takes them off the hook for taking responsibility for putting themselves out there. Cause it could be scary when you're in your forties or fifties and you haven't been out there on the dating scene or wherever, whatever situation they're in. I mean, dating scary, no matter what your age is. Right. Right. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more because I have worked with women of all different ages, even mm -hmm. up into their 70s, yeah. and they still can find love. It's, yes. And I do think that a lot of these things, as I was reading your book, Krista, I was thinking a lot of these things can also be kind of like barriers for us to hide around. Like if we mm -hmm. believe these myths, and we're going to talk about some more of them, but if we believe these myths or fantasies, it can give us an excuse as yeah. to why we don't do anything. We can kind of hide behind them, right? Oh my gosh, yes. A lot of them are really just excuses. And it's hard because I'm really calling people out on some of these things. And sometimes when people reading it, when they're reading it, they're like, ooh, that is me. And I am using this as an excuse, but I think it's a much more empowering context 
when you are single and you do want to find love to really distinguish what your excuses are, what barriers are getting in the way, what mindsets are getting in your way. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I did find that there are these consistent mindsets, these consistent fairy tales, myths, whatever we want to call them here, excuses that really do get in the way. And I want women to have freedom to not be bound by these fairy tales, to not unconsciously take action or not take action because they believe in them. So that's why I want pe people to break their glass slippers and be able to find the love they really want. Yeah. Yeah. So another big myth is centered around men, whether it's there's no good men in my city, state, or country. You know, we've heard this from women of the world, right? Or that the men that are, that there's no men that are available for a relationship or commitment with me. All the good ones are taken. Like this is another big myth that comes up for a lot of women, right? Oh, women love this one. <laughs> oh, they love this one. They hold on to this one so tightly, their knuckles go white. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's so true. <laughs> Why because that yeah, they're just like there are no good men, and like, and 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 there's there's a lot of things going on with that one. It could be they've been hurt, so in their reality, they've just been hurt, and they've kind of created this perspective that there are no good men, and so they've given up. But also, there's just this perspective that they're that they've taken that on because they haven't met any good men. So because they haven't been in situations where they've met good men, then they make a decision that there are no good men. And then you have all your girlfriends saying there's no good men. It's a fairy tale. I mean, it's that's why in the book I even document, it's like happens in movies over and over again. It's this messaging, no good men, no good men, no good men. I mean, imagine as women, we kept hearing the messaging, there's no good women, there's no good women, there's no good women. It's just a message there. Yes, dating's a sorting process. You have to sort through for the good men and not good men. But if you're not finding any good men, it means you're maybe not in the right locations. You're not putting your, yourself out there in the right scenarios, or you could just be, you know, not knowing how to date and to sort. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the main thing with no good men. It's just, you just, you just haven't been meeting good men. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm postulating there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and don't you think Krista that that belief can become, we can develop confirmation bias around that belief. So in other words, if we really believe there's no good men, what are we going to see? What are we going to experience? We're going to experience men that are not good yeah. men. And that's yeah. going to reinforce that belief yes. to the point that it's hard to even be able to see a good man if you were right in front of us. Exactly. It's like the rosy glasses. You just have these glasses on. There's no good men. So then here you are showing up on dates. Well, this isn't a good man, you know? And so then you're, and there's a vibe to that. There's a vibe that women put out when they actually really in their heart believe that fairy tale. It's a guarded. There's a little like maybe competition energy that's like, you can't, you're not going to hurt me kind of like a little protected person. And so they're showing up that way on the date. And so then they're like, Oh, that person disappeared or they didn't ask me out again. Well, it may not be that they're a bad guy. It may just mean that like you showed up kind of guarded and closed and weren't allowed. You didn't allow yourself to be even somewhat connected to this person because of that perspective that you're seeing him through. So there's no chance for a man to show up as, as a good man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. How about this one, Krista? Okay. Um, how about the belief that I intimidate men or men are <laughs> can't handle my success. Uh, I scare them off by who I am and I would have to be less. And so a secondary belief under that would be, and so I have to be less than who I am, yeah. or I have to dumb myself down in order yeah. to attract a man. Yeah. Now that happens a lot, especially with successful single women who have the money, have the house, have the family, they have it all right. And then they're showing up on the dating scene. And then, you know, a man says, you know, you're intimidating or, you know, you're too intimidating. And it's really easy for women in that scenario to internalize that and to think they're doing something wrong and to think they need to smush themselves down to not be as successful. But here's the thing. 
there's two things that are happening with this I'm too intimidating. One is that you may be dating men that actually aren't in your caliber. So they're naturally going to be intimidated by your level of success. But a good fit for you is actually going to be impressed by you, be inspired by your success, love your financial stability, love what you're up to. And then there's a match there. You just maybe haven't been meeting. So these guys that are saying you're intimidating and you don't feel good about it, that's on them. They're just not dealing with their own fear, their own insecurities. And sometimes men do that. Sometimes they put it off on you instead of being more vulnerable about it. Like I'm scared of you and I'm intimidated, but they still try because they're attracted. So you don't want to put, take that on, but here's the thing that a woman can take responsibility for Michelle is that what I find is that women could, actually be coming across as intimidating, not because of their success, not because of their money, because of how they're non-verbally communicating, how they may be verbally communicating. They may be communicating closed offness, not available, not approachable. And so that's on the woman, you know, and there's a lot of woman, women that I deal with that, you know, they have it all right, but I can tell on a phone call with them. I can tell as I start working with them, they're showing up closed off. They're showing up with their guard up They're They're not open. And so I help them to start softening up, letting go of that guard. And sometimes that takes some deeper work to figure out what that all is. Right. I mean, we all have things we need to grow and learn from. But I really recommend that women actually communicate nonverbal openness. When you walk into a room, make eye contact, smile, instead of like being in your phone or like not being receptive to talking to people or things like that. So there's two things going on with that in, from my perspective for that I'm too intimidating fairy tale. One is on the guy and he's probably not your guy if he's putting it off on you. So there's no need to squish down your success. And the others on the woman to be more just receptive to connection. Yeah. And I think also, uh, I think sometimes without meaning to perhaps a woman can come across as being like competitive with the man. Maybe she's yeah. trying to impress him. Right. Yeah, and she, or she's, yeah. or she's trying to kind of make fun of him even in a conversation. Oh. I mean, you know, we've had those kind yeah. of conversations with people where it feels like no matter what you have to share, this other person is going to one up you. Oh, right. And yeah. that can happen even in dating relationships sometimes. Mm. And so mm. then maybe a man really is kind of put off by that because he's thinking, where would I even fit in this woman's life? Where, where could I contribute or make a difference? So I think that's yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I just think that I, I see that happening too, Michelle, because I do find that women don't know maybe what to talk about on a date. So they're like, well, let me talk on my resume and talk about how awesome I am. I mean, yes, you, you want to, you know, share your success and there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I feel like when women do that, they're trying to impress and, instead of trying to connect. And a man is competing all day. You know, he's working hard, just like we are. We have to go into our masculine selves when we're working too, right? But when it comes to a date, I would say from my experience, a man wants to experience your femininity, wants to experience a true connection. So if you're trying to prove something instead of being more like receptive to connecting, that can be a shot in the foot um, because then you're, you're not contributing to a connection actually developing. Um, but a connection can happen, I think, by talking about your successes, but not when it's in a competitive way, like, oh, I'm better, you know, it, it reminds me of that, Annie, o was it Annie Oakley? Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. And you don't want that energy on a date. Right, right, <laughs> right. That's, and I think one of the ways that we can lead with connection yeah. instead of the resume stuff is if we share more from a heart center place. Mm. So in other words, even if you're sharing about your work, for example, if you're sharing something about your work that you love or that is really meaningful to you, it can come across mm. so much differently and it allows a man to see kind of a glimpse inside of who you are and not just what the CV or resume might say on paper. 
Yeah. And also this is an opportunity to really lean into your womanness and to kind of feel feminine. And, you know, to me, femininity is about like feeling and about expressing from, oh, I just feel so delicious right now. I just, I felt so excited today when I had that meeting and I just felt really inspired. There's a certain warmth and feminine, feminine deliciousness in that kind of talking. And again, I'm being outraged, you know, over the turning it up the dial a little bit, but mostly just to be an example. But I feel like that kind of almost sensual talking. I'm not even talking about sexual, just being in your feelings, being in your body, sharing from what you feel. I feel like that goes a long way in inviting a man into connection instead of having him be more in his head. I mean, cause that's what women, I hear women complain all the time. I want an emotional connection with a guy. I just want a guy that has emotional intelligence, but then they show up on the date in like interview mode and like competing with them. So you're not going to be inviting a man into that. If you're trying right. to. That. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It's so true. It's so true. And I think probably we've all done it at one time or another, or have been on the receiving end of that. And it doesn't feel very good. No, no, <laughs> it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, has the, it has the effect of making you want to pull back and retract. <laughs> and like never text that person again. Right. Like that like, didn't feel good. Oh, gotta go. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah, it's seven o'clock yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so another one I want to touch on, um, yeah. and I don't know if this is a, a myth or a fairy tale, but this is certainly something that I bump up against um, in talking with my clients or they're bumping up against. Yeah. Might be a better way to say it. And that's time, like finding the mm. time to focus on and put attention on your love life. And I think one of the reasons that people struggle with this, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on this, is that they feel like on some level, by making this a priority in their lives and not filling up their lives so full that they don't even have time for dating, let alone a relationship, it gives them the feeling that if they were to make that a priority, their love lives, that that would be more like like there's some kind of desperation underneath it or something like that. Oh, like they yes. feel like yeah. this should just happen. This yeah. should just fall into place. I shouldn't have to do anything or put any emphasis on this. And so I did this too, Krista. This is, I guess, yeah. like the reasons this jumped out a lot in your book when I read it about the busyness. Yes. We fill our lives and our schedules so full. Mm -hmm. Then for me, what that did is it, it allowed me to kind of ignore kind of the pain that was there and the emptiness yeah. that was there of not having a relationship because I was so busy and so committed to so many different things, mm. many different people that I didn't have to deal with the feelings and I could kind of hide behind the busyness. Yeah. Yeah. So many, so many of us do that. I mean, busyness is just an easy way to avoid feeling any of those intense feelings. And busyness can easily take over our lives, you know, especially like in the book, I really paint this picture. Like it's really become an epidemic. I even did a whole TEDx talk about you're not too busy for love. I mean, I go into detail about, about this and, and we're, and we're praised for being busy. No one's oh, going to yeah. call us out. Like if you're like, Hey, um, um, you know, how's your love life? What's going on? Oh, I've been just so busy. And then you're like, Oh, I'm important. You know, like I'm important. I'm busy. And we get praised for it. But the thing is, I wanted to bring this to women's attention that they do this because Again, like you said, they use this as an excuse to not make their love life a priority. And I really understand what you said, that women, if they make their love life a priority, they feel like they're desperate. But I, I feel like there's something underneath that. I, I really feel like if they're concerned about coming across desperate, I think what's underneath that maybe is like scare, being scared having some fears, having some apprehension, not wanting to come across so direct about it, really owning it. You know, one of the most powerful things that I do with people when I first meet them is delicately and gently lead them to a place where they actually admit that they want to get married. Do yep. you know how many people convince themselves in their head? Like, well, I'm okay. And I'll be all 
all right. And I got everything going on. And if it doesn't happen, it'll be okay. So they're all in this like justification and I get it. Right. Because we have society getting on us left and right that we're not supposed to be single. You know, you're not a hundred percent if you're not with a man. So there's this weird pressure. Right. And so then we do this, we create these justifications instead of just like owning it. Like, yeah, I actually do want to get married in my heart. And you know what? I do want to experience a family. I do want to have that in my life. There's a beauty in a woman getting to into a, to a place where she can actually powerfully ad admit that to herself. And then from there, then it's like authentic, like it's authentic. I really want that. And then, you know, then there's just other things we need to work out to get them into action again. But, um, yeah, the I'm too busy really takes them off the hook. And we have, a, and what I talk about in the book too, we have this inner stepmother, right? Cinderella's <laughs> stepmother was so hard on her. Like, no, you, you can go to the ball, but you got to do all this work and you got to get your own dress. And so she's like working, working, working. We have our own inner stepmother that just makes us work and work and work. And it keeps us distracted from going to the ball to finding someone for us. Yeah, and I think the inner stepmother also picks at us and finds reasons as to why we're not ready. We're not ready. Like Cinderella couldn't go to the ball till she didn't get her work done unless she got her work done. But for us, it might be, well, you can't date until you lose that 10 or 20 pounds or Ugh. you can't date until you sort out this or that from your life, you know, whatever it might be. Yes. And, and women can put their love lives on hold for years, oh, I know. decades for some of these things that are, are just not, not going to be the key or the answer to them finding love, you know? Yeah, I know. And dating really brings up this deep vulnerability. It does. It's that same vulnerability that we experienced as children where our hearts were purely open and we just got hurt because our hearts were so open. And then when we get older and we kind of close our hearts a little bit and try to muster through the best we can. But dating is can be a huge trigger for people of that that deep vulnerability that we have. And sometimes people don't want to deal with that hurt and pain from their past they sweep it under the rug, they get busy. And then it's a year goes by, two years goes by, 10 years goes by. And they're like, I thought love would have happened by now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why and I, it happen? Yeah. Why hasn't it happened? Well, and I think if there's a gift, well, there's, there's perhaps other gifts, but I think one gift that has maybe come from 2020 mm. is, that in speaking with people out there, both female and male, um, yeah. um, I think it's brought to the surface to a lot of people how important it is to be in partnership and to find love mm -hmm. and to a relationship or priority. Because many of the people that I've talked to, maybe their lives have slowed down a little bit. Maybe things shifted. Maybe they lost a job or maybe their job ramped down for a period of time, or maybe they weren't able to be so busy doing all the things that they were doing before. Mm -hmm. And so like what happened, they actually felt, they actually began to feel yes. that void and that emptiness that maybe the busyness was masking for a period of time. And I couldn't agree with you more, Krista. I just want to emphasize this too. In my work with people, I do a very similar process where I ask people, you know, if you could have anything you wanted in terms of your love life, what would that be? And I get those answers like, you, well, I kind of like to have a partnership. I kind of maybe I'd like to get married and blah, blah, blah. And it's like people believe they're clear about what it is they want, but actually saying it like you're saying is so powerful to actually clearly and distinctly say it for me it was I will meet and marry the man of my dreams that's what I wanted that was what I wanted I wanted to get married I wanted to have partnership and I wanted to be with someone that I was really excited about being with right but actually saying owning that and allowing that feeling to come to the surface and get in touch with what it is you really want I think is such a powerful person mm.
I, yes, it is so powerful. And just going back, you said some really great things about the pandemic and people being busy and the pandemic kind of slowing us all down, right? I had some concern about this chapter. Like, is this chapter going to be something that gets transformed during this time? Because I feel like the pandemic forced people to not be busy. Mm hmm you know, they, they couldn't just like go out and they couldn't go to the bar and they couldn't go to this event and they couldn't kind of stay distracted. And it, I think it did force a lot of people into their feeling space and um, to deal with that. And I think some people dealt with it. And I think there's a lot of people who haven't dealt with it and they've projected and they've been doing some weird stuff like in the world. And stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, as human beings, a lot of times we'll go to great lengths to avoid feeling those feelings, right? Yes. Or yeah, like just even, really looking at the truth. Yeah. Like in the, in the book, I talk about that experiment where people were left alone in a room for 15 minutes with nothing in the room, but them sitting on a chair and they would electric shock themselves to be able to get out of the room faster because it was more painful for them to be alone in a room for 15 minutes the, then to just then to do the shock like that's how much we want to avoid our feelings that's it's kind of crazy when you think about it yeah yeah i do remember reading that in the book and thinking that is just incredible that the lengths that we will go to I know, I know, I know. to avoid feeling those feelings because because it's uncomfortable it's not comfortable a lot of times to feel those feelings especially if they're feelings of sadness or yeah. emptiness or even that deep longing that someone yeah. might have. like those are not easy feelings to just sit with no and yet when we allow ourselves to feel those feelings and to consider what they might mean for us it can allow us to be in a place of choice where we're not just going through life on autopilot yes I think our feelings are like ocean waves, you know, they come and go, but sometimes when we have a traumatic event, especially like a divorce or a breakup, there's so many intense feelings that we, we try to navigate those feelings and we kind of, we can easily shut our heart down and try to mitigate feeling it. But what I found over all these years of living that when I just feel what's there, it, it passes through and you get through it, right? But sometimes when we don't allow ourselves to feel it, it can get stuck. It, 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 it never fully goes away until we really feel it. And I, I think people do have a fear that if they, they do feel the intense feelings that they'll get stuck there. But I actually feel like the opposite's true. It's just like you feel it and then it, and it does dissipate, but there's so much work involved in not feeling a feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, you talk about fantasies and the fairy tale fantasies, and you give, you know, examples from Disney and Disney princesses and things like that in the book, which is a really fun way to approach this subject and a really creative way to approach this subject. I always say fantasies is one of the F words that keeps our love life. <laughs> Fouled up. I'll just say it nicely. Fouled up, right? <laughs> Fantasies um, can come in so many different forms, mm -hmm. and yet we can convince ourselves, you know, so clearly that the fantasy is the truth. But this mm -hmm. is an area, and I think it's true for all areas of life, but this is certainly an area where breaking through the fantasies and getting to the truth can transform what is possible for you. The truth really does set you free. Truly. Truly. Hashtag truth right there, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. So I know for other women, a fantasy that I've seen is um, they believe that if they continue to invest, they continue to give to a guy, that eventually that guy will eventually see how valuable they are. Like, in other words, they're trying to earn or win his love. Mm -hmm. And that if they continue to invest there, they continue to be giving, they give more, they mm -hmm. give deeper, they try to prove them. It's kind of a proving thing. <laughs> I'm already, my heart's already hurting just hearing you say all this. <laughs> and you know how, you know how those go. Not, they don't go well in the end because we're believing, we're believing a fantasy instead of 
who this man really is or who a relationship really or what a relationship really is and what this person is capable of providing. So that's another area where I think we have to be careful about fantasy and be focused on the truth, be willing to look at not only who we are and what we want, but who this person is that we're dating. And if this person is in a place to really be available to you, if you want real love, I mean, can he really be that Prince Charming? Is he really in a position <laughs> to be there for you? And, and, or is there something that's whatever good qualities he has, is there something that's blocking him or is not available where he's not going to be available for you? You know, whether he's, still separated but hasn't really made the break from his wife or whether he's just for whatever reason not available emotionally or he doesn't want the same thing that you want mm -hmm. and so women invest sometimes in these lengthy relationships mm -hmm. and end up empty-handed and broken-hearted mm -hmm. yeah because they're caught in the fantasy they find a guy they catch a guy and they're like okay you're it but he hasn't indicated or led her towards exclusivity. So that's why one of the things that I try to highlight in the book, but also teach with my clients is to, to we, we objectify men, you know, men are blamed for objectifying us and our bodies. We objectify men by projecting our fantasies onto them and they see it, they know it. That's why a lot of men pull away. But I think if we're grounded in what we want, grounded in our values, open and receptive, and actually looking at how his actions and how he's showing up in life and really making like a, what I call a reflection connection, like really like looking at how he, how he connects, reflects, you know, like, you know, almost like old fashioned, like let the guy kind of take the lead. I kind of feel like the only options we have as single women are the men that are pursuing us. So one, you want to let men pursue you and then you're, your only options are the men that are pursuing you if you're pursuing a man you're investing your benefits what i call exclusivity benefits in a man before he's even asked for them that's when it's going to start feeling off balance that's when it's going you're going to be like in a two-person kayak and you look back and you're like wow he's not even rowing i'm the only one that's putting in the effort here so that's why i think women need to learn a little bit more about residing more into their femininity, receiving, allowing him to lead, allow, allowing him to pursue her. And I'm not saying a woman not make any effort at all and just kind of lay back and see, I definitely could genuinely facilitate a connection. But it, it, women, I don't think are empowered or really know how to date in this way. Um, and then they do waste time, sometimes months, sometimes years of their time because they've just attached to him in the beginning. The, he's it, but he hasn't asked her for exclusivity. He hasn't talked about anything long-term. And so that's why it's a different way to date, but dating in this way that I'm talking about actually triggers a lot of like um, anxiety and um, in women because they want to just lock it down and that women have this like need to attach quickly, especially if they're providing sexual benefits or emotional benefits before he's even asked for exclusivity, a woman can get easily emotionally connected. And then she just wants to lock it down and make sure there's a commitment because it feels more comfortable to her to be intimate in that way in an exclusive thing but he hasn't asked her for exclusivity. So it creates a lot of messiness. So one of the things I recommend to women is to wait to give these benefits until exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Take it slow, see here where he leads you. No need to jump into being his girlfriend right away. Like he's a stranger. <laughs> Right. That's right. He's a stranger. <laughs> That's right. I often tell my clients, I've never had in all the years I've been doing this, I've never had a woman say to me, boy, I sure wished I'd had sex with him sooner. I've never, never had I never heard that either. <laughs> but I have had women say, wow, it would have been big to slow things down there in the beginning because uh, boy, that didn't quite go the way I planned. Right. I have had that. And so um, I, <laughs> I know that there's there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of benefit. It takes time to get to know someone. And yes. if you're wanting a real relationship, if you're wanting a loving, committed relationship or marriage, like we talked about, first of all, it's really powerful to know that and say that. 
Yeah. And next of all, to be guided by that in your interactions. If that's what you want, mm-hmm. you want to set yourself up for what is more likely to be a successful relationship. Because when I hear the stories from women, you know, the of the relationships that didn't work out or that have broken their hearts, I'll often ask them this question, Krista. I'll say, okay, I know hindsight's 2020, but in looking back on it, you know, with hindsight, were there any warning signs, red flags, yellow flags mm-hmm. caught your attention that could have predicted that it would go this way? Mm-hmm. In almost every case, mm-hmm. the answer is yes, right? Mm-hmm. But we get attached, like we're talking about, we get attached to the fantasy of who this man could be or what this relationship could be. And then we kind of put on the blinders or the rose yes. glasses. Yes. And what there's a saying that says, when you have on rose colored glasses, red flags just look like flags. (laughs) Yes. And that's a good one. I never heard that one. (laughs) Because of the rosy tone. You can't see them. You recognize that. (laughs) So (laughs) when we are are like grounded in knowing what we want and making our decisions from that place that feel right and authentic to us and we're grounded in the truth, we don't often, we don't as often get caught up in some of these fantasies. No, no. And that's why I think it's so important for people to intellectually from their mind, like understand each of these fantasies that they could easily fall into. Cause I think when they're undistinguished, they're kind of, they play out unconsciously. It's kind of like, I'm un, like, I'm kind of revealing in the book, like the different paradigm of each of these so that a a woman can kind of see herself in it and see that she does it. And then when you can see it, then you can make powerfully make the choice. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. When you shine the light on it, then it's going to be invisible. It's not going to be, you know, running the show underneath the surface anymore. Yeah. 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 So I'm so glad you wrote this book. This is such a great book. And we're going to put the link to it and also the link to your website in the description here below so that people can know how to get your wonderful book. I highly recommend it. I've read a lot of books about love, dating, and relationships. And I can say I really, really like this one. And I really, really like the things that you're bringing Mm -hmm. to the forefront, which is one of the reasons I wanted to feature you on the show. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage everybody to... Uh, you know, if you feel like your love life hasn't quite gone the way you want to, and you want to understand maybe why, I really recommend that you pick up the book mm-hmm. and then check out Chris's website as well. Is there anything you would like to say to our listeners before we wrap up, Krista, or anything I could have asked you or you wish I'd have asked you? I think the I think the main final thing, really, Michelle, is I just invite your listeners just love yourself. You're, you're the only one that could really love you. And when you love yourself and you're really in tune with that love, then you have some beautiful love to share. And, you, and then that's a beautiful place to date from, to attract from, and to find a healthy love. Mm. Well, I love that you're ending with that and so powerful and so true. So this has been just a blast to connect with. <sighs> I'm so happy to be here with you. I've really loved it. I really love dancing with you. And I so resonate with what you're teaching and with what you've shared in your book. And I'm so glad you wrote it. And again, I encourage everybody, if you're, if you've struggled at all in your love life, or you feel like things are just not going quite the way you hoped, this could be a really good uh, support tool for you. And so check out the links below and be sure to join us again here on the channel. And thank you so much again, Krista. It's been a delight. Such a delight. I loved this so much. It feels good. Yeah, it feels great. All right. Thanks so much. And thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now. Bye.